I just had to nip back to the back and do the cameraman bit as well, so I uh, hope you can see me. Uh, I think Josh is probably going to have to adjust me a little bit, but uh, we'll do that in a few minutes' time. It's great to see you here this morning and to be in God's presence. Let's just pray, uh, and then I'll just go through a few notices and announcements, uh, and then we'll get on with the rest of our service. So let's just pray together. Father, we thank you that we are able to meet together this morning We thank you for your wisdom and your mercy in granting us this day uh, when, unlike any other day, we can uh, spend time, set it to one side, uh, to think and to worship you and to have fellowship with each other. Lord, we pray that today you would do a work in our hearts and we ask that as we meet together this morning, whether it's here at Bethel or whether it's over the internet, Father, we ask that we might hear your voice, uh, that we might catch a glimpse of your face and that you might do us good this morning. Bless our time together, we pray. Be with those who are discouraged and give them encouragement, we ask. Be with those who are finding things tough. Strengthen them, Lord. Be with those who are grieving and fill their hearts with joy and hope and love. Now, Lord, you know each one of us this morning. We pray that you would meet with us as you know uh, we have need. So we pray that you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, as I say, it's great to see you this morning. There's a few announcements, which I'm just trying to call up on my phone here. Uh, First of all, um, it's good to see Jim and Jane here this morning. And many of you will have seen or been at uh, the funeral on Monday of Maureen. So please continue to remember Jim and the rest of the family in your prayers. Uh, Jane's very kindly um, sent us a card here at Bethel, so let me read it out to you, and I'll just put it over on the communion table uh, after the service, rather than pinning it up in the foyer, so that if you want to have a look at it, uh, you can do that on the way out. So it's to everyone at Bethel, thank you to everyone who attended or watched Mum's funeral, and for all the people that helped make the funeral run smoothly. Thank you for your support in many ways, through prayer, sent messages, cards, and flowers and then a great statement of faith and certainty. My mum is at peace now. Love from Jim, Paul, Jane, and John. Thanks, Jane, for putting that together. And we will continue to pray for you in these uh, difficult days. You will have received a bulletin uh, with the email that was, uh, gave you the link to the service or invited you here, and many items on that. Uh, Joan and Peter, remember that uh, Grace's funeral is here at Bethel this Friday coming at 10 o'clock in the morning. And again, it's the same rules as last time due to the ongoing restrictions. Uh, It's by invitation only, uh, but we'll have a link the same as we had for Maureen's funeral. So if you want to watch uh, Grace's funeral, that will be available on Friday morning. And that link will be sent out this week. Um, Pray for Rob and Jill. Graham Dyke is in the Granby Hub and he's undergoing rehab, and he seems to be settling in okay. There are many other items down there on the, uh, on the, the, um, the newsletter that we need to pray for. Uh, Stan came through his operation, and so did Peter Roberts. Uh, um, they, they both went well this week, and so we can pray for their continued recovery. So acquaint yourself with that. Use it as a, um, uh, as a diary for prayer this week as a nudge to to bring these people before the Lord. Um, Well, this morning is going to be a little bit different in some ways. We're going to be saying goodbye this morning to Kemi and Oye. Uh, They're leaving to to go to Scotland uh, this coming weekend. Before we say goodbye to them, it would be nice to be able to say hello to them. Well, I've been assured they're on their way. Um, They're a little bit delayed, and so we'll be interviewing them in a few minutes. So things might have to be shifted around a little bit. Um, So let's uh, stand together and we will listen, hum, and if you're at home, sing along to our first hymn. The theme this morning is going to be about the love of God, the amazing, wonderful love of God. So we're going to sing a hymn that we sang a couple of weeks ago uh, in the evening. Loved with everlasting love, led by grace, that love to know. Let's stand to sing together. Loved with everlasting love, led by grace that love to know. 
Gracious Spirit from above, you have taught me it is so. Oh, this full and perfect peace, oh, this transport all divine, in a love which cannot cease, I am His, He is mine. In a love which cannot cease, I am His and He is mine. Heaven above is softer blue, earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue Christless eyes have never seen Birds with gladder songs overflow Flowers with deeper beauty shine Since I know, as now I know I am His, He is mine I know, as now I know, I am His, and He is mine. His forever, only His, who the Lord and me shall part, I with what? A rest of bliss Christ can fill the loving heart Heaven and earth may fade and flee Firstborn light in gloom decline But while God and I shall be I am His and He is mine But while God shall be I am his and he is mine please sit down I can never listen or, or uh, sing that hymn. I think a lot of you are going to know what I'm going to say without thinking of Norman Moore. Heaven above is softer blue, earth around is sweeter green. His testimony was that when he walked across Nugent Park after he'd been saved, everything was a different colour <laughs> um, because he knew that the Lord was his and he was the Lord's. Well, it's great, Kemi, and oh yeah, our prayers have been answered and you've arrived. We said, uh, before you came, we said it would be uh, great to say, be able to say goodbye to you today, but before that, we'd have to say hello to you. And so, please come to the front, and um, Sue's going to just ask, ask a few questions. Anthony, if you could s sit over in this one, and if you, Kemi, can you reverse yourself into the gap here? Let me get this chair out of the way. That's wonderful. So... Um, Yep, they've been with us for a few years. Uh, we're going to find out a little bit now about their pasts and their hopes for the future. I'm in the evening, so it's uh, so you, you've got me out on a Sunday morning. <laughs> it's lovely to see you both, actually in person, isn't it brilliant? And we want to say a really big thank you for all the contribution that you've made to our fellowship and the time that you've been with us. But you haven't always been in Liverpool. So can you tell us a little bit, oh yeah, first maybe, about how you got to be here, where you, know, where you started out and how you got to this point? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sue. Um, yeah, marriage brought me here, <laughs> in summary. However, um, I have the opportunity to say a big thank 
you to the Lord for the opportunity to know you all. And um, I want to express the fact that um, personally, uh, I know when I experienced the true love of God and I felt loved. And um, I felt my wife was and is loved. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I felt, um, you know, I could experience the true Christian love. God. Thank you. I want to thank uh, uh, Bethel for your love. Yeah, thank you very much. So, Mary brought me here. Yeah. I, so where did you start out then? Yeah, so... Um, and we know you've ended up in the best place <laughs> in the world. <laughs> <but you know. laughs> yeah, so, um, well, I was born um, in November of 1967, back in Nigeria, and um, to a, a, a Catholic family. And, um, of course, I so went to school and all that. And um, talking about my Christian experience, so I was a very proud... Catholic. I'm not saying there's nothing, anything wrong with uh, being a Roman Catholic, but uh, we believed a lot in works. We believed in the sacrament of confession. So I was a proud Catholic, and therefore it was difficult for me to have a personal relationship with Jesus because I hinged my relationship on the fact that I don't smoke, I don't drink, I have only one girlfriend, though I was a fornicator. And um, and um, so I, I go to confession on Saturdays, so I'm good. I'm going to heaven. And so I wouldn't listen to any gospel message. I said, God preached to the sinners. But sometime in 1987, I was an undergraduate in the university, and someone gave me a scripture, and I couldn't sleep. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, it says, For all our righteousness, I like fill the rags before God, and I sank. Because I hinge everything on my righteousness, and someone is telling me that my righteousness is filthy rag, I fought it and I couldn't fight it. So I had to listen. And that was how I became a born again Christian sometime in 1987 as an undergraduate. And um, so I, that's about my salvation experience. Then, of course, I met Kemi um, for the first time through her sister, Yemi, as we went on national service. Um, I met her sister first, Yemi. Um, we were on, in, my, in Nigeria. When you graduate from the university, you have to serve the nation compulsorily for one year. So through the national service, I met her sister, and we were in the Christian fellowship together. So through her sister, I met her at um, a Youth for Christ event. She sang there. And somehow, something clicked, yeah. But I didn't take any action. And um, somehow, she, we went our separate ways. I, I, I moved to the northern part of the country. And um, she went back to school. She was an undergraduate of medicine then. So that was it. Um, somehow, I drifted again to the southern part of the country in a city called Port Harcourt, um, where I met my late wife and got married. And um, so I never attempted to get in touch with her because I knew I used to like her. Sorry. <laughs> so so I, didn't, I didn't try to get in touch with her at all. I didn't know anything about her whereabouts or where she was until, um, unfortunately, in March of 2018, um, after a long fight with uh, um, what they call lupus, um, my late wife, Agatha, uh, succumbed and um, she went to the Lord, a good Christian. And um, of course, I, the need came for me to uh, remarry. Yeah, so uh, um, yeah. So I prayed to the Lord, and um, interestingly, God reminded me of her. Yeah, <laughs> that you used to like a girl many years ago. But I fought the idea because I knew she will be much advanced than I as a sister. Because I didn't have a contact. Is your sister still? Um, she has a family. How many children has she got now? Oh, she's not even married yet. Really? God is interesting. So the story continued. I said, could, could I please have the privilege of just talking to her or meeting her? And of course, she talk, told her. And um, 
Once she had the permission that I could call her, and the conversation started sometime in um, early 2020. Yeah. yeah. And that's where I found myself. <laughs> so not to take much of our time, that's the summary. <laughs> Do you know you could make a film of this, couldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> a lovely romance, wonderful, thank you. Um, Kemi, are you going to add something about, of your story? How, how did the Lord lead you and save you? Oh, I'm not sure I was expecting to be this emotional this morning, but <laughs> I'll try to keep myself. Yeah, I grew up in a Christian you know, church going Church of England, we call the Anglican Church family back in Nigeria. And we actually grew up in the same city, even though we didn't know each other you know, early in life. So grew up there and we'll go to church, you know, do everything. You know, my grandfather was a very good Christian. And so we're very you know, into church, we sing all the songs, the hymns, everything. But what was lacking for me was the one-to-one -one with God, that was definitely lacking. So even throughout secondary school, I recall you know, some scripture, you know, SUs then in Nigeria. I really didn't understand what it was all about. But it was when in 1986, it, between 85 and 86, I went for my A-levels in 85. It was a boarding school, it was up north in the, in the country. And there was a Christian fellowship and it just felt that there was something different about those people. Theirs was not just going to church, it was actually that personal relationship. So that was when I began to understand that actually Christianity is you on a one-to-one -one in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that was what led me to accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I went through those phases where you know, it took time to really, really understand it and to accept that that you, know, you mean that is it so of course maybe answered a few altar calls you know, before really understanding that when you come to christ you confess your sins he embraces you and then you start a journey yes you might not be perfect at the beginning but that's the start of the salvation journey so that was my story but one thing that was crucial for me i would say that god caught me at the right time and why do I say that? So I grew up, then went to a boarding house secondary school, girls only, very protected, nothing much. Then I found myself in A-levels, mixed boarding, boys and girls, 14 years going into 15, and you can imagine, almost like for the first time, you know, you're being told you're beautiful. Before you knew it, I was a pageant, you know, I was Miss Schoolhouse, Miss the Block D. I, so when I look back, it was that time when, as a girl, you're coming to reality of your potentials in so many ways. If it's beauty, I was into sports, I was an athlete, a long distance runner. So it was like everything was opening up. So when I look back, I would say, God caught me at the right time. In that sense, at least I could then have Christ to guide before I went too far and you know, made all sorts of mistakes. So I, I thank God that was my story. Yeah. And as the years rolled by, decades, I found myself in Liverpool in 2001. And I've been in Liverpool since then. So what brought you to Liverpool? Was it your work? No. Um, but as, as you said, I told you I was an athlete, so I, I wasn't born on the wheelchair. So I was uh, on my feet, everything, did my medical school, finished that she in was 19... on her feet when I so, knew her for the first time. Back then. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I finished university in 1995 as a medical doctor and did you know, my one year of housemanship as we would do. So I was in the second year post-graduation doing the national youth service that um, Oye referred to earlier. And somewhere along the line, I took ill. And by 1997, found myself on the wheelchair with all sorts of you know, challenges. So from that time till that 2001, it was really a battle with my health. So I actually came into Liverpool 
in an ambulance. So it's really interesting. So because I came for medical treatment and we didn't know anybody in Liverpool, so the best way they could organize my coming to Liverpool was straight from the airport in Manchester, an ambulance from Walton Neuro picking me up straight to the Walton Center. So that actually was how I came into Liverpool in 2001. So. You definitely could make a film of this, couldn't you? <laughs> so, Oye, what's next? Very, very briefly, because, yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, we thank God we got married on the 29th of March, right here. And um, now, God blessed um, Kemi with um, another job at um, Five Council, NHS Five in Scotland. And um, of course, we've, uh, the arrangements have been concluded for us to move down to Scotland. Yes, and um, that would be done by, by the end of um, July. We will have moved to um, Scotland. Yes, and we're sure going to miss everyone and the love and the fellowship of Bethel Church. Yeah. But you'll visit us. Yeah, we, we sure will. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we have it in mind to visit, um, especially when the lockdown is eased, so yeah. that we can have a pro say a proper bye-bye. And I will not be saying half faces, but full faces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when you do visit, Kemi, you must come and sing to us. And you're going to sing to us now, is that right? I will. I will. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thanks you so much, Sue, and thanks to everyone. Thank you. So this song says, At the Cross. It's a reflection of the sacrifice on the cross, which is the ultimate love of the Father to us. Your glory fills the highest place. What can say? 
Your glory fills the highest place. What can separate me now? You saw the grave and you made the way. When you said that it is done, you saw the grave and you made the way for Fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to pray for you in a minute, but while you're getting back to, to your seat there, um, Sue said a couple of times that you could make a film out of this. Uh, well, we haven't made a film, but Paula Taylor has actually carried out a more extended interview over Zoom with Kemi and Oye. Um, that's going to be made available on uh, YouTube um, as soon as we can get it up on the, on the site, edited and, and fit for you to watch. So you'll be able to catch up with more of their story if you do that um, in these coming days. But let's pray for Kemi and Oye now. Let's commit them to the Lord. Father, we thank you for our brother and sister here. We thank you that we know that they are your children, that they have been saved by that same precious blood that was shed on the cross as we have been saved. And Father, we thank you and we bless you that our times have been brought together for these past few years. But now, Lord, you have in your perfect way, in your perfect plan, uh, for our, our ways to, be, to go in separate directions. And so, as we say goodbye to Kemi and Oye, Lord, we commit them to you, that their lives might be filled with the fragrance of God, that their way might be made clear and their path might be made smooth, that as they uh, arrive up in Scotland, they will find a place where there are believers, where they can worship and share together the things of God. Father, we pray for their health and we pray for their strength and for all things concerning them, that you would put your hand of blessing on them. We bless you for these years. We look forward to visits. But we look forward beyond that, Lord, to a day which is uh, yet to come when we will be together in glory, when there will be no need for wheelchairs or any means of uh, separation in any way, but we will be together in a perfect way and we will see you as you are. Oh Lord, bring that day, we ask. But in the meantime, bless our brother and sister with your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, well, um, we're going to read God's Word together now, and uh, it's found in the first letter of John. I'm conscious that Sunday school are in, in the hall, and they're going to be finishing at some time, so if I start to speak more and more quickly, it's because I'm trying to catch up with a bit of time, but uh, we'll see how things go anyway. First John, and we'll actually start reading at the end of chapter 2. And we'll read into the first few verses of chapter 3. Let's hear the word of God. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, 
We are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. We pray that God would add a blessing to the reading of his word. And as we come to it now, let's pray together for understanding and for uh, the Holy Spirit's help as we look. Father, we thank you for your word. We know that it is light. Uh, We know that it is truth. We know that it cuts like a sword. We know that it corrects when we go wrong. We know that it teaches when we need to know. And Father, this morning, we know that that same word can be used in the hands of the Holy Spirit to encourage the downhearted, to rebuke the the, the one who is in sin, to heal the backslider, to draw back the prodigal. And Father, we ask that as we open this word now that you would do all of those things amongst us and to all who would listen, that glory might be made uh, to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and that his kingdom might be extended amongst us in these days. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when Dad died in 1997, um, I had to take Mum to the shops in Shoebrook. She didn't want to go on her own. And uh, they went quite often, virtually every day they go down to the shops. Doris and Owen, they were known as, I don't know whether it was the gruesome twosome, but they were certainly a team. And they didn't want to go alone, and uh, mum didn't want to go alone and have to tell everybody the sad news of what had happened quickly over the weekend. So off we went, uh, and I was on hand to answer the awkward question at the right time as we made our way around the shops. When we got to Allen's the Butchers, do you remember Allen's the Butchers at the end of Green Lane there? When we got to Allen's the Butchers, um, I was chatting to Alan, and uh, I told him the sad news, and he looked me up and down in rather a quizzical way. And then when I told him that my dad had died, he almost fell over. I said, are you okay, Alan? He said, "Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. He said, I I looked at you and I thought that it was Owen, but he'd forgotten to put his brill cream on, which uh, I took as a bit of a, uh, not really a compliment, as I was 40 years younger than dad. But when he had a chance to look me up and down again, he realized that it wasn't Owen, it it uh, it was me. And he said the resemblance was so great. Uh, that he thought I was somebody else. You, you can't choose your parents, can you? And you particularly can't choose the physical attributes and the behaviours they pass on to you. I quite often find myself standing like Dad would stand and looking at myself in the mirror, or sitting there watching the television and the thumbs are circling like this, just as he did and just as his father did before him. Some people inherit physical characteristics, a nose, a chin, the eyes, or a voice. But normally, there's some way in which we resemble our parents. Well, here in the passage that we read together, we are told that we are children, that we are children of our Heavenly Father. And John, the apostle who Jesus loved, writes his first letter here, and we find ourselves at the end of chapter 2 and beginning of chapter 3, where the apostle of love speaks yet again about the issue of love. I have three points this morning. I might only have two if time goes, but I'll have three to start with. Be aware the depths of God's love. Secondly, be sure the assurance that you really are his child. And thirdly, be like Jesus, the demands of God's love. Likeness to him begins now. But first, let's put the whole thing into a little bit of context. Who was John? Who was he writing to? Why was he writing? Well, this is the Apostle John. He wrote the fourth gospel. He described himself in that gospel as the disciple that Jesus loved. He was one of the the three musketeers, as I like to call them, the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. So often you read their names together. Uh, And they accompanied Jesus to some of the most special parts of Jesus' ministry, healing the raising of Jairus' daughter. The three of them were there with the mum and dad and Jesus. The transfiguration, Jesus took them onto the mountain uh, and the three of them, alone with Jesus, saw Jesus, uh, uh, caught a glimpse of his glory. And they were with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane leading up to the cross, Mark 14. Paul, the Apostle Paul, called John one of the pillars of the church. You can read about that in Galatians 2. And you can read a little bit about him in Acts as well. Peter and John went to pray 
Remember the old children's chorus, silver and gold have I none. Well, that was Peter and John. Uh, And although Peter did most of the talking, John was there. He went off to Samaria again with Peter to help the new believers there. And he grew to a great age. Possibly he was the last one of the eyewitnesses. And he probably wrote this letter uh, late on in the first century, 50 or 60 years after Jesus had walked the earth. And his writings are saturated with the thought of God's love. In fact, if you look through his gospel, you find references to the love of God more there in that one gospel than in the other three put together. Who was he writing to? Well, there's no to and from in this letter like there is with Paul's letters and Peter's and James and Jude. But it appears that he wrote this letter uh, to, the, to be taken round the churches of Asia Minor, He's probably gone to Ephesus by now, uh, where uh, it looks like he'd settled there in Ephesus. And he was writing to struggling Christians, finding it hard. They were under attack by false teachers. And of course, although the local churches were the initial recipients, through the providence of God, we are also the recipients today, as we read God's word together. Why did he write the letter? Well, there's a theme running through of the need to live an authentic Christian life. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it look like to be a Christian? How can we tell a true Christian from a counterfeit Christian? How can you go about getting assurance that you really are saved? It's really important. Uh, He he wrote this to believers. You can turn forward to chapter 5 and verse 13. Uh, And John writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. It's written to Christians. But he goes on to say, so that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. So that you might be assured that you have eternal life. So that's the who from, the who to, and the why of the letter very quickly. So let's get on to the three points. Firstly, be aware. See, behold, look. That's the thought here. Just marvel at the kind of love that God loves us with, says John. Now to understand the magnitude of the love of God, we have to understand something of the wonder of the gospel. What has happened when a sinner comes to faith and is saved is incredible. Paul paints a picture in many of his letters of the transformation that has taken place. Just look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. He says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But Paul says that because of God's great love, God is rich in mercy. You see that, don't you, in verses 4 and 5 of Ephesians 2. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he's loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, what's he done? He's made us alive together with Christ. And then again, Ephesians 2 verse 3, we were by nature children of wrath. We deserve the full force of God's righteous anger because we're sinners. But remember, God is rich in mercy. God is great in love, so he raises up to life and puts us in heavenly places with Christ, Ephesians 2 verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us, not judgment, but in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And of course all of this is done through the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross, dying in our place to bear the punishment for our sin. Here, back in John's first letter, where John asks us to consider the kind of love that God has poured out on us, he takes it to a new level. Not just raised to life, not just forgiven for our sins. He said, but we should be called children of God. From children of wrath, deserving the righteous anger of God, we find that God's love is so great, his mercy is so rich, that we are transformed into children of God. It's no wonder that the sense at the beginning of chapter 3 is just take a few moments here to try and get your head around this. The word that John uses in the Greek is potapos. Probably haven't pronounced it right, but that's what the letters look like. And it literally means of what country. John is giving us the idea that the love of God is something completely foreign to us. Where did that come from? We'd probably say in Liverpool these days. It's the same word 
that was used when Jesus and the disciples were in the boat on the lake. Remember, the storm blew up, Jesus was asleep, the disciples were afraid, and they thought that Jesus didn't care. Pick the account up with me in Matthew 8, verse 25. They went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, here's that word, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? And it's the same, ver- same word here in 1 John chapter 3. Look at his love. Look at the storms and the, uh, and, and the, uh, and the, the, the waves um, in, in Matthew's gospel uh, and see what absolute power it must have taken to calm those. But now look here and see the love of God and say, what kind of love is this? that God has bestowed upon us. There's the same sense of astonishment in the letter as there was in the lake. This is like nothing we've ever come across before. The word love, it might look familiar. It's used in many ways these days. It's devalued to a massive extent. And it simply doesn't cut it anymore. It doesn't convey the true sense of magnitude. It's like calling a hurricane a bit of wind. It's like calling a nuclear bomb a bit of a bang. Such is the greatness of the love of God. And there's another, another thing about this love, says John. It's been bestowed upon us. It's been freely given to us. It's not earned or deserved or merited in any way, shape or form. It's given as a gift from God. We couldn't have it if we weren't given it. A while ago I told you a story. I was speaking on... Um, uh, a passage later on, 1 John 5, and I think it was verse 12, whoever has the Son has life. I told you a story, uh, and I, as I was preparing this week, that story came back to mind. It was a man and his son, uh, the mother and wife had died, and there were just the two of them, very wealthy, uh, and they collected fine art, all the great painters, all the great pictures. They went around the world collecting them, and then one day the, the son was conscripted into the army, and he was killed. He lost his life by uh, trying to save another soldier. And he did save the other soldier at the cost of his own life. The other soldier returned back home and painted a picture of the son. It wasn't very good. But he found out where the boy lived and he took it to his house, a big mansion, and he gave it to the father and he said, this is what's happened to me. Here's a picture of your son. Well, the father, in spite of all the Rembrandts and everything else that were in the house, he took this picture, this awful picture of his son and he put it in pride of place over the mantelpiece and every time there were visitors he would take them there first to to see this picture and then eventually the father died there was nobody else in the family and the will said that all of the artwork needed to be auctioned so they went off to the auction now there was a gardener in the story the gardener of the estate that the father lived on and he thought I'll go to this auction and I'll see if I can get this picture of the son as a memento So the auction started and all of the dealers were there and they were a bit annoyed when it started off with the picture of this son, this horrible painting being paraded before them. And the gardener put his bid in and he he, he got the, uh, the, 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 the painting. And as the hammer fell, the auctioneer said, that concludes our business today. And the dealer said, what do you mean it concludes our business today? What about all the other paintings? The auctioneer said, the will was very specific. It says this, he who gets the son gets everything. And so this gardener suddenly uh, was faced with all of this massive, very valuable artwork, which was his. I remember too, do you remember Del Boy? When he found a watch, 6.2 million pounds it went for in the auction, and he just keeled over backwards when, uh, when he realized how much it was worth. I wonder whether the gardener in the story had a similar feeling. I couldn't afford this. I don't deserve this. How have I ended up with all this? And that's a picture as we think of the love of God. I couldn't afford this. I could never earn it. I don't deserve it, but it's mine. The love of God. Jeff Baker, a songwriter, puts it like this. Behold his love, I stand amazed and marvel at the God of grace, that the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the creator of the universe on whom all life depends, should be clothed in frail humanity and suffer in my place. Behold his love and worship him, the God of grace. 
Friends, if you've trusted Christ, the picture that I've painted is, this morning is, is not a picture of somebody else. It's a picture of you. The amazing love of God took Jesus from the glory of heaven to a cross on a hillside outside of Jerusalem where bearing the weight of our sin, he died in our place. For God so loved the world that he gave. His one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I have to ask you this morning, if you don't know this love, now that you see some glimpse of the greatness of it, what is stopping you? Come to him this morning, bow the knee, say that you're sorry, turn to him in repentance, turn away from your sin and find that you will know this love for yourself. We must move on. Secondly, be sure. The second thing that John wants to make clear to us is summed up in four words. And we need to listen to these four words very carefully because as C.H. Spurgeon once put it, this is easy to read but not so easy to feel. Maybe... We are conscious of our own sins and our own failures. Maybe we'd be okay with God forgiving us, but to have all this love poured out on us and to be made children of God, this is too much. Maybe you're in the midst of great sadness or going through a time of physical pain and you, and you don't really feel this love and you, you maybe wonder whether you're even a Christian. It could be that you're troubled about family who aren't saved. Or maybe you feel that if your faith was measured like a, a candle, it would be flickering and almost blowing out. Or perhaps you're just confused and uncertain or racked with anxiety. You know, sometimes we spend much of our life doubting the promises of God when it's been said we should spend most of our time doubting our doubts <laughs> because the promises of God are sure and yea and are men in Christ Jesus. Well, if you're a Christian, John has these four words for you this morning. After talking about the love of God, about talking about the fact that we are made children of, uh, of God, he says this, and so we are. There is no doubt about it. There is no need for you to worry that maybe you can't keep it up because it's not based on you, it's based on him. John Blanchard tells a story when he was counseling a man who doubted his salvation. He thought he could be saved and lost. And John Blanchard took him back to Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. And it says this, For those who, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And though, those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And though, those whom he justified, he also glorified. He pointed out to the man that all these verbs are in the past. As far as God's concerned, they've already happened. You are justified, you are called, and you are glorified. It's the Apostle Peter, isn't it, that tells us that we're not only saved by the power of God, but we're kept by that same mighty power. His love is as real and as true in the dark and sorrowful days as in the bright and cheery days, and so we are. That's God's statement on the matter, not just John's. I suppose that John is really just underlining what he's already said. We are the children of God. Yes, we really are. Maybe he's had to catch himself as he's writing and thinking, what have I just written? Wow, it's absolutely true. Remember, this is a man who rested his head on Jesus' shoulder at the Last Supper. He saw Jairus' daughter raised to life. He saw Jesus on the mountain transfigured. He was with him in the garden. This is John who spent three years walking and talking and learning and listening from Jesus. And then he spent the next 50 or so years preaching the gospel, seeing the coming of the Holy Spirit, being part of miracles and seeing the churches grow uh, and times of great turmoil as well. This is John. Surely at his, at his age, he's seen it all. He's done it all. He's heard it all. But even he is staggered at what he's just written. We don't just take his name, verse 1. We are his children. We're not just called the children of God. He says, we really are. And as if to double underline it, he says it again at the beginning of verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. And I don't know how to put the, where to put the emphasis on that verse. 
whether it's we're God's children now or we are God's children now, we're God's children now, we're God's children, it could be all of them. It's such a mind-blowingly staggering statement that it could be all of them. One preacher put it like this. When, as you look at your own heart, you see so much remaining corruption, so much persistent, habitual sin that grieves you, how will you say, so I am a child of God? Well, you come back to the pulpit of the Father's love, the cross of Jesus Christ, where he preaches to you the devotion of his heart, where he preaches to you his unfailing love for you to make you his child. You are beloved not because you are lovely, but because he loves you despite your unloveliness. And as you take in the wonder of it and you remind yourself again, the ground of my confidence before God is nothing in me, but is the work of Christ my Redeemer, you will be enabled to say, child of God, so I am. And so we are. The fact that we find it hard to accept sometimes doesn't change the truth of it. Finally, we must move on quickly. Be like Jesus, the third point. That's not the end of it, says John. Yes, God's love is amazing and we can be sure of it. And although we can't see everything about the future, you actually see that at the beginning of verse 2, beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. It's important to realize that the Bible teaches us what we need to know. And it teaches us great principles. And sometimes it speaks to us in pictures so that we can understand in our small minds what God is saying to us. We can be sure that we're saved, says John here. We can be sure we've been adopted into God's family. We can be sure that we're his children. But what we will be hasn't yet been revealed to us. But don't get yourselves too wound up about it, he says, because there's a certain principle that's given to us. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet appeared. But this is certain. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. Because we will see him as he is. It's staggering, the thought, that we will be like him one day. When we think of his words and his deeds as he lived on earth, his character, compassion, humility, patience, meekness, purity. Uh, but this is only what we know of the, 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 the Son of God while he walked the earth, when he was, as Charles Wesley put it in the Christmas carol, veiled in flesh. But when we are told that we will be like him, the little rider that John adds is amazing. For we shall see him as he is, as he really is in all of his power. Remembering the glimpse that I got on the Mount of Transfiguration, but now seeing him as he really is. This is an absolute statement of fact for all believers. Can I just briefly summarize what I want to say here is this last point. It's like John saying to us, we haven't got the full picture now of what we will be like in the future, but we know this for sure. When Jesus appears, when he, he, because he is coming back, you know. I hope you realize that this morning. Yeah? The Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, and it could be very, very soon. Amen. He's coming back, you know. And when we see him, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is in all of his power. But it's like uh, John is saying here, but don't wait for that day to be like him. Look to this day now. And as we read through the rest of the chapter, we, we see in the next few verses, it's a call to righteous and holy living. Yeah, one day we will be like him and we'll see him as he is. But let's start that process now and let's be like him today. Imitate Jesus, he says. Don gave us some tomato plants. Thank you, Don. <laughs> And they're out there in the garden, they're coming along just fine, growing like wildflower, taking over the whole of the bed. I'm hoping to see some tomatoes, uh, but that wouldn't happen if I went along this afternoon and chopped off all the branches. The picture that Jesus paints in John chapter 15, John chapter 15 again, is this. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Abide in him, says John in chapter 2 of his letter, verse 28. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him. 
So if we are abiding in him, imitating him, we shouldn't be surprised that the world will treat us in the same way that it treated him. We'll be misunderstood and shunned. We read that in verse 1 of chapter 3, that we should be called son of God and so we are, children of God and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. We have this in common with Jesus. Just as they rejected him, so they will reject us. Just as they shunned him, so they will shun us. If they see his likeness in us, they will reject us too. And we started off by saying it's a family thing. There should be some likeness that they can see in us of Jesus. The world is already kicking against straightforward, Bible-believing Christianity. The words of Jesus that tell us there is a cross to be carried and trouble to be expected, they're becoming more and more real every day. So if we are called to imitate Jesus in his suffering, we should also be ready to imitate him in his sanctification. And you can see that, as I say, in verses 4 and onwards in chapter 3. You are part of the family, says John. You really are. You can be certain that you are his child. You bear his likeness. So be like him. Act like him. Do everything that you can do as he would do it. So help you God. Be aware. God loves you with an amazing love. It's an out of this world love. Be sure. Our adoption as children isn't based on us, it's based on him, so we can be certain that it's final. Be like Jesus. We will be like him one day. So why not start now? As one person said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be like Jesus then. I want there to be as little of a culture shock as possible. Be like him now. Let's pray together. Father, as we have raced our way through this passage this morning, we pray that you would write the truth of it on our hearts, that if there are those who are struggling with doubt, Father, that you would give them the assurance they can rely on from your word, that they are yours, and that nothing can take them away from you. Help us in these things, we pray, Father. And for any who don't know you as Saviour, Lord, please, We ask that you would help them this day to realize your great love and to respond to it as they would bow the knee, repent of their sins and turn to Christ. Help us in these things we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt and all my pride. If you can stand, please stand with us as we sing and listen to this one together. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the
love demands my soul. My life, my all. Let's pray together. Love so amazing, so divine, divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Father, we thank you for the amazing power of the gospel that it turns sinners into saints, that it brings life to the dead, and that it brings glory to those whose lives are only shame. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. And God's people said, Amen. Please be seated.